Sure. Sure. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, so, uh, I turned on my camera. Can you see me or not? I don't have to have a camera. I didn't know if you wanted me to. There we go. We have you now. Okay. Um, uh, so, uh, my name is Marcy Foster. I'm a senior technical advisor in the SNAP Office of Employment and Training at USDA's Food and Nutrition Service. Um, I'm very pleased to be kicking off this webinar today with MDRC and the Seattle Jobs Initiative. Um, we are bringing this to you today through the SNAP to Skills project, which provides technical assistance to states to improve and expand their ENT programs. Um, SNAP ENT is a federally funded program that provides SNAP participants the opportunities to gain skills, training, or work experience that will improve their ability to obtain regular employment. And that is a that is our statutory purpose. So that is the, the, the stated purpose of the program. Um, but we do lots of things to help SNAP participants uh, to fulfill that purpose. And SNAP to Skills is one of them. This is our, one of our flagship technical assistance projects that's operated since 2015. Um, SNAP to Skills has provided enormous benefits to FNS and to state SNAP agencies across the country. Over the last six years, um, we've offered, been able to, through SNAP to Skills, offer TA to 28 states, We'd offered state institutes and learning academies, and many of you have probably participated in those. We've also provided tons of written materials and webinars like this one for all states and ENT stakeholders. Um, so through SNAP to Skills, states have increased staffing, they've created dedicated ENT units, experimented with new models, um, and they've really thoughtfully brought on new partners to diversify their ENT programs to make sure people are getting the services they need. Um, and SNAP and so SNAP agencies have built bigger, more expansive programs. And so then about two years ago, after this focus on increasing programs, FNS really shifted the focus to increasing participation. So after taking a really careful look at participation, we knew that there was a need not just to focus on building better programs and bigger programs, but making them more attractive to SNAP participants and doing a better job of communicating the benefits of ENT and, and really the rights and responsibilities of SNAP ENT participants as well. Um, so then the country was hit with the COVID pandemic almost immediately after we started this project. And so of course this brings exceptional challenges to state SNAP agencies not just on ENT, but on certainly mostly on the eligibility side and on SNAP participation. Um, so, you know, state SNAP agencies, of course, were figuring out how to adapt ENT and adapt their systems to continue to meet the now extraordinary employment needs of SNAP participants, but doing so in a safe environment. And so now as we're emerging from the impact of COVID-19, and we're certainly not out of the woods yet, the administration is turning attention to setting a foundation for an inclusive economic recovery. And, and we think SNAP ENT can be a powerful part of that. We need to continue to build partnerships with high quality ENT providers that offer industry recognized credentials, uh, training that's tied to the labor market. And we need to renew our focus on making these services available and attractive to the participants, to SNAP participants across the country. So no matter if they're delivered virtually or in person. And so with that, today we're joined uh, by experts from MDRC and SJI to talk about the current methods that SNAP to skill states are using to help serve more SNAP participants in ENT by using behaviorally informed strategies. So these methods are often really common sense strategies that require us to take a little bit different perspective on program design and the ways that we communicate about ENT to potential participants. So no matter where you sit in the ENT program, if you're a provider, an ENT staff, or even eligibility staff, um, this process will help you understand how your program operations help or hinder ENT participation, whether it's immediately or down the road, and then what you might be able to do about it, steps you can take to address those um, barriers. So before I turn it over to Clint again, I just wanna take one additional note. So although there will be a ton of good information in this webinar, um, this technical assistance webinar does not represent policy guidance. So if you have ENT policy questions, and we know that we're getting a lot of them, 
as we just um, published our final rule makes a lot of changes to the program. If you have any ENT policy questions, please direct them to your FNS regional office because we're not able to answer them on this webinar. So thank you for that. And thank you to the Synaptic Skills team for the opportunity to provide these opening remarks. Um, so Clint, I'll turn it over back to you. Thank you, Marcy. And thanks to all of you who have chosen to spend an hour with us today. I know you have a lot of things going on and we've worked hard to make the your choice to sign on, a good one for you. I'm Clint Keith from MDRC's Center for Applied Behavioral Science, and it's my privilege to share some of what we know about innovation and what we've learned about sparking engagement in SNAP ENT programs. Fortunately, in addition to my voice today, you'll also get to hear a bit from some of my amazing colleagues from the Seattle Jobs Initiative, SJI, and from MDRC, Bob, Donna, and Nick. Um, could you all please, in that order, come off mute and say hello so people will know who they're hearing when they hear you? Bob? Yeah, hi, Clint. Thank you. Yeah, this is Bob Thibodeau with uh, Seattle Jobs Initiative. Uh, happy to be here and uh, hopefully can uh, provide some, some insight and uh, uh, examples for you as uh, Clint goes through these, uh, this presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Donna? Hi, this is Donna from MDRC. I'll have my video on next. I'm just having a little bit of an issue with it right now. COVID times are always an adventure. Nick? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm Nick Codd from Seattle Jobs Initiative and also glad to be here and, and, uh, and part of all this. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. And you'll hear from Bob and Donna and Nick as we go through the, the content for today. I also want to point out Annie Utterback, who's here and helping us to navigate all things, but particularly um, things related to the technology of this. You'll be able to find her in the chat and she'll be able to help you to resolve any problems that you might be having um, with Zoom and with the structure of the meeting. Before we dive into innovation and engagement, I'd love to say just a few words about the project that brought this webinar to be, Snap to Skills. And as many of you know, Snap to Skills is a program of the Food and Nutrition Service to build effective, more effective and job-driven SNAP ENT programs. Over the last year, MDRC and SJI have been lucky to engage with seven states to build capacity to engage with participants. These states have been doing amazing work and making big strides. As part of the project, we've been developing tools and approaches that those states and all other states can use. And this hour is born from those set of tools. Though these approaches emerge from the work of S2S, the approaches and tactics that I'll share today have broad general applicability. They were developed by applying behavioral science and it's really just a fancy set of terms, but it's the study of when and how people make decisions and take the actions that they do and the practice of creating context that align people's choices and actions with their own preferences and goals. We use similar strategies in other human services domains. We use it to refine and strengthen our own work. I most recently used this approach to develop and assess different strategies to keep my kids from interrupting when I'm doing webinars and trainings from my basement, and we'll see how it goes. It'll be sort of a in-process use test. So with all that said, let's dive right into the content. So today we're gonna to be talking about innovation and change and how to make it a part of your everyday activities. When people hear about innovation, the pictures, the metaphors, the images that form in most people's minds are images of speed, the classic Silicon Valley move fast and break things ethos. Today though, I wanna anchor our thinking and approach on the opposite end of the speed spectrum. When you think about adapting and changing in the context of your SNAP ENT program, I want to convince you to be glacial. I'm not going to encourage you to go slower than you need to intentionally, but rather to center ourselves and center our focus on doing big things. The lovely valley that's on the slide here is in Glacier National Park. And it's important to know that it wasn't always a valley. Inch by inch, adapting its path to places that it could change over thousands and thousands of years, slowly but persistently, a glacier carved this valley. They brought it into existence. It was brought into existence through persistent effort. And so in your ENT program, I'm going to encourage you to make big and impactful changes to support all of your persistent participants in engaging and making it to the next step. But to do that by exercising each and every day a persistent push to change that incrementally shapes and is shaped by the environment that your ENT program operates in. 
I can hear some of you out there, though we have you on mute. I can actually hear you through the mute saying that you're not the TVA. You don't have the staff and the budget to build a valley, and you have too much going on to commit to thousands and thousands of years of work. And I hear you, and I don't disagree. You are busy, and you are resource constrained, and you do have countless obligations and focuses that are non-negotiable and have to be attended to. At the same time, I work in behavioral science, and we know the power of the status quo. Newton's first law of motion, a body at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by an outside force, works just as well in studying programs as it does in physics. But we've spent the last year working with ENT programs in S2S, and all around the country, we've seen over and over again something else and something that I feel like I know for certain now. And it's that all over the country, every day, in every SNAP ENT program, at every provider, leadership, staff, stakeholders, even participants are figuring out adaptations to make the status quo work, and even more so this year. Can you imagine 18 months ago if I'd turned up in your office with some harebrained scheme to shift all your operations remote over the course of a month? You would, you would have laughed at me. You would have thrown me out. But look at where we are now. Look at all the ad adaptations that you've made. And even outside of a global pandemic, staff are constantly adjusting their practice to meet the needs of participants, the preferences of provider partners, the requirements of the compliance and systems in which they work. They're doing their jobs. They're figuring stuff out and getting stuff done. Every time a state adds an additional partner, Every time states adjust to new rule changes, as you've all had to do to the Agricultural Improvement Act of 2018 that was designed to strengthen ENT programs um, in relation to work requirements, you've made innovations, you've done adaptations to make the program work better. Yeah, uh, Clint, this is Bob Thibodeau. Hey, I just wanted to interject here. I, I know. One of the things we're seeing from, from a lot of the states that we're working with is uh, the adaptation they're doing as far as uh, technology. Uh, you know, the, a lot of these programs were depending on in-person instruction and learning, uh, but because of the COVID pandemic, they've had to, to shift to doing uh, distance learning and, and using technology to, to help with that. And as we know, many, many of our participants didn't have the uh, the laptops or the, the tablets they could use to do that. So many states are, are you know, figuring out ways they can get those, those laptops and, and tablets to the participants so they can learn. And the other thing about that too, they're learning is that uh, many need uh, digital literacy so they can learn how to use those and use them to the best advantage. So, and, and many of those states are, are, are talking about, you know, even after the pandemic is over is continuing some of that distance learning because they were seeing that it's increasing access to their programs. That's right. And thanks so much, Bob. And I worry, though, that so much of the innovation that hap happens out in the world, out in the field today, is ad hoc. So much of it is trapped inside one agency or one office or the mind of one employee. And it's ephemeral. And so little of it ends up being systematically tracked and assessed to know if it makes sense to lift it up and be part of our everyday process. And so my challenge for all of you today is to think about how you might harness this creativity and energy that already exists in your offices and your programs and your staff and apply it in a structured way to your ENT program. It's clearly within the, your agency's capacity, but it's tempting and because status quo bias is strong to wait for an outside force, to wait for new rules or regulations, to wait for a pandemic to wait for some contractor to show up with a fancy acronym like CQI or PDSA that they tell you will solve all of your troubles. Now, all of those approaches have merit. We use all of them in our work at MDRC. But I wanna be clear that you can innovate and adapt and improve every day rather than waiting for a special standalone moment to do it. So what we're going to do today is we're gonna share a framework to get you going in that systematic adaptation of your program. Here's a rundown of what we're going to share. It's a loose framework that you can adapt to meet your needs and goals and to the work and to work for you and your team, for your program, for your context. I wanna emphasize, I know I've emphasized this three or four times already, but really it's the most important thing. These aren't mandates of the only way that this will work. It's a starting point to find something that works for you. 
What I'm going to describe is a cycle that moves from identifying problems to developing solutions, to implementing them, to assessing, and then beginning again. Throughout, we're going to refer back to ENT programming and some of the challenges that we've observed working with ENT states. As we're passing through each of the sections that are listed on the slide, I want you to be thinking about how it might look for you, how it might look in your program, what you see an obvious way to make work, what you might want to think about or get feedback from your colleagues. To support that, we've made a worksheet to accompany this webinar. We're going to put a link to it in the chat. It's an fillable PDF. After the um, webinar, you could also print it out. I'm going to mention it throughout. It's a place you can start to plan right now while you're listening, while you're engaging with the webinar, how you might implement this approach as you're learning about it. At the end of the session, then you'll have a copy to keep. And if, and if you use it um, while we're going, you'll walk out of here today with most of an innovation plan that you can start to apply right away. With everything that's new and different, you have to start somewhere. But you shouldn't start just anywhere. This is, an, this is Iceberg Lake, it's in Glacier National Park. And I put it up both because it's striking, but also because I want to make an important point. This is a photo that was taken at about 6,000 feet of altitude and after a three or four mile uphill walk to get there. It's not the hardest hiking glacier, but it's also not the first thing that I would try after spending a year in COVID quarantine at sea level. I think about ENT problems the same way. It's just kind of like hiking uphill at altitude. We want to start small. Here we're designing for persistence, for a process we're going to use and keep using, and not for exhaustion. So as you're getting started, pace yourselves, find a manageable scale, get used to using these muscles. So perhaps try it out on smaller engagement challenges before using it to redesign a new MIS system or to revamp your entire intake flow. You can use it for those things, but I wouldn't suggest doing that first. People will often come into webinars like this that, and look for someone like me to tell them the solution. But what we know from our work in behavioral science is that every good solution starts with a good problem, something that isn't working the way that you want. Having a problem in your program or in your office isn't a failure, it's a constant in all of our lines of work. And it's an opportunity to make things better for your program, for your participants, for your staff, for your partners. In MDRC's and SJI's work with ENT programs, states and providers have been generous and brave to share many of the challenges and problems they've faced in the implementation of their ENT programs. And on the screen, you'll see a, a list of the most common ones. You'll be pleased to know that the upcoming S2S toolkit will explore these and offer tools for addressing them. And today's framework is designed to be complementary to that. I hope as you're seeing these, it sparks some thinking about what you might wanna take on first in your agency. And maybe it isn't any of these and that's okay. These problems from the toolkit also give us a foundation to make our advice today concrete. Throughout, you'll hear us use examples of handoffs that we've observed in the ENT program and solutions that can help to strengthen them. I suspect that most of you with very little reflection could identify one or two areas of concern in your program, and that's good. That means that in your new everyday approach, the approach that we're sharing today, you won't have to spend lots of time searching for something to work on. You'll probably have the opposite problem, too many things to work on right away. But that's okay, because we're gonna work glacially. We're gonna prioritize now, make progress, and then continue to work going forward. You might, if you've already opened the worksheet, see a space to record a problem, but hold on, don't use that just quite yet. We have a different idea um, for it in just a second. So a couple of notes on problems to get us towards a way to choose what to work on first. We understand that things on the previous slide are persistent challenges, and we don't pretend that we've just discovered them, um, and we don't pretend that your agencies and programs haven't been working on them for a long time. We hope that your prior experience grappling with problems like these will equip you with the knowledge about what works or what doesn't for your program's context. One of the things that's been fantastically interesting in working with the states is, in S2S has been the broad range of experiences that states have with similar efforts in, in a similar program structure. Though all the states are operating under the same federal rules and regulations, each is in its own context with its own unique blends of relationships, systems, staff, and participants. Some have dedicated navigators, some are embedded with other programs. Every state has been unique as we've gotten to know them. And in the same way, your innovation process as you build it will be essentially local and adapted to your problems and needs. 
And the problems that you observe and the way that they manifest will be specific to your participants. They're at the center of all of this. And at this early stage and throughout each of the stages that we talk about, we want to cultivate empathy with them and understanding of how they might see ENT or fail to see it at all in the context of the place where you're working, in the context of their lives and their hopes and their dreams. As we think about what to work on, it's never a bad idea to think about what participants would tell us to work on. And it's even better to ask what they think we need to work on. And not just participants. Your ENT program is embedded in a web of relationships with programs and systems. And working on a problem in ENT may intersect with these. Sometimes it may enable new solutions. Sometimes it may constrain the paths that you have at your disposal. All this to say, all of you on this call know your local context. And as you're getting started with this innovation cycle, we want you to embrace your local context as opposed to ignoring it. Now, specifically, here's the first thing we think that you should do to innovate. We want to start by getting folks in a room and getting some ideas out. This is our version of what that might look like. You'll need to make your own. You'll see space on the worksheet if you have initial thoughts about how to approach each of these elements. Whatever you try first, we encourage you to be reflexive through this process to apply the same spirit of learning and adaptation that you're bringing to program activities to your own internally facing work. Maybe you try and have this meeting and there's a less robust discussion than you hoped. Consider what you could try differently next time that would better spark an exchange of ideas. Do you need different people? Do you need a more focused question? Do you need a different timing of the meeting? Calendars can be hard, when we're starting and we're trying to start small here. So as we're making innovation part of regular practice and not something standalone and special that we do on the side, we suggest starting with a meeting like this as a small agenda item as time set aside during some other regular meeting. The goal this time is to create space for staff to share about problems that they're seeing and the details of the problem that they observe. If your goal is different, build your own path. Be as general as specific as you want and as you find helpful and as you're creating these spaces, find something that works for you to, to surface and lift up problems um, that you might consider working on. Our goal here is to diverge, to get to a broad list of from a broad set of perspectives. And that requires a broad set of attendees. You, you, you know your people best, but a mix of people, different types of jobs, different levels in the organization, including people external, including partners or even participants, can bring important new perspectives in at this phase. For example, you might include program managers, eligibility staff, case managers, specialists, providers. On your worksheet, most of you hopefully have an idea already of someone whose perspective you know is going to be valuable in something like this, figuring out some a place in your organization. You can write that down on your worksheet. One group or person you definitely want to have in the room. In terms of timing, we've done projects where we've done this stage in five minutes. You could spend 30, you could invest three to six weeks if you really, really wanted to. For me, briefer is better. We wanna work glacially, but we also want momentum here at the outset. We wanna have energy in the room. I'd say 10 minutes is a good starting point and you can adjust up or down based on your timing constraints, based on what, when people are available. Importantly, there should be donuts. They're scientifically proven to spark creative thinking. You can write down your flavors on your worksheet. Um, I was asked to make it clear this is just a joke. We're not telling you to actually buy donuts. So if you've now you've got the time set aside, you've brought the people together, what's on your agenda? During this time, you want to be developing broad thinking. First, I suggest an independent brainstorm followed by sharing and discussion. You can give staff a framing question, for instance, if we ask participants what part of our process needs work, what would they tell us? People won't need long to think, maybe a minute or two, maybe even less. And to show you how easy this can be, let's try it together right now. So in the next 30 seconds, think about that question. If my program's participants ask me what part of my process needs work, what would they tell me? Take just 30 seconds to think. Write it down on your worksheet. If you have your worksheet open, write it down on a piece of paper in front of you if you don't. If you have neither of those things and you want us to share, feel free to drop it into the chat. But take 30 seconds now and think, what would participants tell you should be your focus of your first innovation?
And there's your 30 seconds. Congratulations, you've innovated. We're already off to a great start. Now, in your meeting, you're going to be asking people for input. You're going to be asking people to share. And we want to make sure that we have a plan in place to capture and preserve the ideas. Getting a nice long list means that we have, want to be able to keep coming back to it. I suggest starting simply. It could be a shared Word document where, so, where everyone takes notes together and contributes ideas. If you already have a staff discussion board or a staff wiki or a wall in an office, for those of you fortunate enough to be back in physical spaces, all of those are places we want to have a way to preserve. The best tool is the one that people can use, starting simply to make sure we preserve ideas and have them to come back to. So imagine we've had this meeting and everyone's talking about handoffs, um, which is our focus um, for our example today. Nick, I'm hoping you could share some of the things we've heard about handoffs in the course of S2S from the states that we work in just to help to frame out um, the problem that we'll work on together today. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Clint. Right, so we've worked with a number of states um, that have been you know, looking at, at, at handoffs and, and the, the main handoff that, that's been focused on typically starts with the SNAP eligibility worker that needs to help to refer and transition somebody on either to an ENT provider out in the community, a community-based organization, a community college, a career center, or potentially to an employment specialist or employment navigator that they work with you know, within their state or, or, or county department. Um, so very important handoff, um, but also one that, um, that, that you know, creates some challenges. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, and so you'll hear a lot about handoffs today, and that'll be the, the sort of handoffs that we'll be talking about. We know that they can mean a lot of things in different programs, but that's the way we're thinking about them now. Now, often at this early stage of innovation, people get hung up. The problems that emerge from a brainstorming exercise like the one you just did feel too big and too old. And we see so many failed efforts that get hung up on the problem and never make the transition. And we know that it feels risky. And we often put pressure on ourselves to be perfect. And we perseverate on implementation barriers before we even get to the fleshed out idea. So I wanna remind all of you as you're thinking about implementing and leading change that there's no perfect problem, there's no perfect solution. What we do is we, tr we try things, we observe, we learn and try and do better the next time. We know that starting is scary, but we also know that you can do it. And we ask that you remember that the status quo that we're all biased towards also isn't perfect. And that's why we're here and why this program and project exists. And that's what compels us to continue discovering and trying new and different things. But you can't work on everything at once and you shouldn't try. We know that glaciers move by centimeters and not by miles and that ENT is going to be with us for a long time. You're gonna to have to start somewhere. And at the end of your brainstorm, you probably have lots of ideas and lots of things that you'd want to work on them. So you're gonna to have, to have to prioritize. And we wanted to give you a tool that would allow you to systematically think through the ideas, consider the ideas, compare some apples to oranges and choose what to work on first. When we're supporting partners at this phase, we usually ask them to consider three attributes of the problems that they've described to us. We ask them to, for each problem, consider the extent to which it's important, how close it is to the organizational's core mission and goals. We wanna make sure that we don't solve a problem that's sort of like rearranging the deck chairs where it's solvable, but it doesn't really matter if we solved it or not. We wanna make sure that we identify problems that are feasible, where change related to the problem is within the span of control of the agency that's engaged in this innovation process. We don't wanna get caught up in negotiations with other agencies or working on things that we know ahead of time are going to require substantial upstream approvals or system adaptations. It's not bad to work on things that require those, but they're bigger efforts and we wouldn't want to pick those up first. Remember, we wanna start small and manageable just to get used to the process. And we wanna identify things that are impactful. We wanna make sure that if we successfully identify, implement a solution, that it would make a real difference in the level of engagement that we observe. They would make a real difference in the lives of our participants. Uh, to give you an example of what a consideration for one thing might look like, 
Um, Donna, if you could describe for us, please, um, with handoffs, how we might think about the importance, feasibility, and impact of that as a problem. Sure. So, you know, as you say, using the example of handoffs that you've just mentioned, um, I've identified that the handoff between, let's say, eligibility and the ENT navigator could be the most important for the following reasons. It could be the most important because let's say it's the location where it's possible to interest the most number of SNAP participants to learn about ENT services. That's why it's important. Um, it's feasible because there may be some smaller tweaks that could be made to shorten the period of time between notifying the participant of ENT and having him or her meet the navigator. And we'd say um, that example could be impactful because it's if we were able to get more people interested in ENT, we could make more referrals to our services. That's just one example. It's a great example. So thank you for, for sharing it. And what we're looking for as we look across the problems and we go through them is a good balance. We, the Goldilocks problem, if you will. It's not too hard, it's not too small. The one that, that's just right. And Sometimes it'll jump right out at you from your list of problems. There will be a strong consensus in that, in that first meeting. And other times it's harder. And one of the things we try and support organizations in doing is as we're at the outset of this process to have a plan for how we're going to select. And you know your organization, you know the ways that organizational decisions get made effectively. Some organizations, will have a discussion and try to come to a consensus among their group of stakeholders. Some will put it to a vote of staff who are participating in the process. Some will decide by leadership, we have a top-down directive that we need to improve X in this quarter. And so that's going to be our focus for this first innovation cycle. There's nothing wrong with any of those. They can all be really effective in different organizations, but it's critical to have a plan for which one you're going to do. And to be clear with and transparent about that, um, with your staff. You'll see in your worksheet that there's a line to include your plan for prioritizing, um, just to mark down how you think you might go about deciding what to work on first. So oftentimes at this exact moment, we get asked, can't we work on many things at once? Can't we, can't we just tackle everything or at least two or three things? And our advice is always not to. And it's first because innovation can be, involve resources, hopefully not Many want to, be, want to be resource manageable and adding additional problems can get in the way of that. But we've also found that tackling a problem like handoffs, for instance, sparks spinoffs, other problems that we have to tackle in the context of dealing with the main problem that we're working on. And so having one idea at the beginning that we start with means that we'll be able to focus, that we'll be able to devote the resources needed for any branches that emerge from it. And this means that many most of the problem ideas that your team has created are going to get paused at this point. And that's okay. Because remember, this is a cycle. We're going to go all the way through and then you can come back and work on the next problem um, once you get through the first. And change is incremental and we're going to be persistent. We're going to do this many times and not just once. And now we get to the exciting part. We've identified a problem to focus our innovation on. We know what we're aiming at. And now we get to start solving. There's so many good ideas about what to do in ENT programs that it's hard to not jump ahead, to be focused on the problem first and let that guide our solution. To make this transition tractable, to make it real for you, we're going to share some example of how we approach solution development and offer suggestions about how you too could approach solution development. We'll keep focusing on our handoffs example as we go through, um, but we want to make it clear that we're what we've made one more transition. We've gotten a bit more precise in our understanding of the problem. So in addition to handoffs in general, and that being a concern, you heard this in Donna's remarks, you heard this in Nick's, we're going to focus on a very specific moment that we feel is breaking down um, in the current process that we're thinking about, which is the tr transition to that very first contact with the ENT. A person's gone through eligibility, but now we're needing to hand them off um, to an ENT specialist and the solutions that we could develop to get people over that hurdle, get them to the next step of engagement. 
sometimes there's a supposition that us behavioral scientists are like wizards, that we talk to some people and go away and think really hard, and then we come back with the perfect silver bullet solution. But in practice, solving problems is a team sport. We know that there's wisdom in the crowd and the diverse perspectives can show new paths and warn us away from paths that look good from the outside, but aren't. And incorporating those who will implement the solution in the solution design process can also help to build buy-in and support um, as we look forward towards implementation and assessment. And that's important too. Who the right people are will be in part determined by what you're working on. As we're thinking about the specific instance of handoffs, it would be amazing to have staff on either side of the handoff on either side of the transition in the room thinking together. It'd be great to have the people responsible for current best practices and for compliance and monitoring that relate to these handoffs. It'd be great to have the people who are involved in any systems and technologies that might be invoked as part of our solution. If we think we might need to send messages to clients, if we think we need to, might alter data collection in the MIS, having those people thinking together at the outset is critical. In the solution section of your worksheet, um, thinking about the problem that you identified before in the brainstorm, or if you skipped out, um, thinking about a general problem, the RR problem, um, take note of who you might want in your solutions design team, whose experiences whose voice has contributed to good solution development in the past. Up to a point, it's the more the merrier, but we know that time is, exper is expensive and schedules are hard, and that we don't wanna wait a month to find that one hour where all the stakeholders that would be perfect could attend. So we suggest you try something feasible, see how it goes, and then you can ask for the next cycle, whose voice was missing, whose perspective would have enriched our consideration. Did the solution we developed with this first process we tried achieve the goals that we set out for it? And so just like folks sometimes think that we're wizards, they think that only a few people have a monopoly on good ideas inside of agencies. And that's absolutely false in my experience. As we're developing solutions, there are a lot of different places where we often look for inspiration. We look to people who have a deep understanding of the origins and history of the problem and barriers that clients are experiencing and participants are experiencing to engagement. We look to experiences in other jurisdictions and other domains that have similar handoff or engagement problems to those that we've observed in our A&T program. We look at practices that high performers in our own organizations, whether they're formal or informal, are using. And we look at existing practices and systems in other parts of ENT that have better engagement than or more successful engagement than where we're looking right now. And we look at current workarounds and shortcuts that are being used by frontline staff and providers to make the current system work. And as we apply, have thought about handoffs with our S2S partners at the States, we've seen lots of great ideas emerge from all of these areas. Um, Bob, I'm wondering, I was, in the meeting the other day, you shared some really great ideas that we were hearing from frontline staff. Um, I was wondering if you could share some of those around handoffs with the group. Yeah, sure, Clint. Yeah, uh, you know, we—I know from my experience, anyways, that when you really uh, empower frontline frontline staff and make them part of your your uh, problem and solution meetings that you're having, uh, they really come up with some of the best ideas. I mean, they're they're meeting with and talking to uh, participants uh, every day, and they know what you know what will work and what won't work. So, uh, you know, some of the examples we're seeing are. You know, utilizing uh, email and uh, text messaging to stay in contact. You know, between uh, between handoffs to make sure the, those folks stay engaged. Uh, we have, and we even had one uh, navigator that was taking the initiative uh, to call these these individuals and and making sure that they you know knew when their appointment was, when they were going to meet, and, and and making sure you know those folks stayed engaged between those those handoffs. So uh, it's it's important you know to have as few handoff, handoffs as possible, and also the timing between handoffs needs to be as short as possible. And now that we know where to look for solutions, um, how are we going to start looking? To get our team on the same page, we find that a shared vision for success, how we want the SNAP ENT participants experience to look after our change is implemented is instrumental. Strong solutions have clear agreement about the action or behavior that the solution will change and the mechanism that we hypothesize will produce the change. 
for handoffs, our vision for a solution might be something like every participant referred to a service provider gets a personal introduction from ENT staff to the provider, and no participant is asked to provide duplicative information. A clearly articulated vision gives the team a standard to compare different solution concepts and to assess changes, innovations that get adopted. A vision here is kind of like a stretch goal. If you're achieving your vision every single time, it was probably too modest. But at the same time, we don't want to, we don't need to carve out the whole valley in this cycle. We want the vision to be reflective of the experience and quality that we think our participants deserve. And we think that this experience would push towards larger programmatic object objectives around persistent engagement and successful participation. There's space on your worksheet to record a vision. It'll probably come later to you as you're starting to implement the solution process. And different groups come to visions differently. Sometimes it's the process leader sharing. Sometimes it's a group discussion. Sometimes it's nominated by an individual and then agreed to by the group. So there's a lot of different ways to come to it, but you should think about the process through which you will develop your vision. And then to enact the vision, we want to keep moving closer and closer to something we can implement. And we're almost there. I want to pause briefly to describe a concept that may be familiar to some of you, but not to others, called the minimum viable product, the MVP. It's a real testable solution that the agency can generate to generate real world feedback and data on performance. It's not going to be a perfect finished final product, but it's a product that's true enough to your vision that we can understand if the vision itself, our implementation solutions have promise and identify parts that need further elaboration and development. I wanna pause for just a minute because in about two minutes, you all are going to have a chance to ask some questions of us um, and just put them in chat um, and we'll get to as many as we can during that break. So for instance, one of the states we worked with wanted to re-engineer the entire referral process. To make it tractable though, and to fit in the time and resources available, we worked with them to develop a small specific change in the communication approach that embodied the larger vision they had for referral. To have an eligibility specialist concretely and systematically explain next steps, to tell the applicant that they were going to share the applicant's name with a navigator who would then call them with an appointment within a specified time window. It wasn't the full process, but it was enough to see how clients would respond and if it would spark engagement. And the MVP concept fits with our inter internally facing goals and framework. We don't need to spend a whole year in development and fine tune every detail and plot out every contingency. We want to learn and test our ideas and get something in the field as soon as possible um, to keep up momentum and to speed up our learning. So this is the cycle that we use to develop solutions. You'll see that it's very similar to the cycle that we use to identify problems. And it takes time, but it takes the time that you have and you can mold this to the time that you have available. We, remember, we don't need an optimal process. We need to find one that works in the context in which we're trying to use it. To give you a sense of how it might look, I'm going to, we're gonna talk through it quickly um, for how we'd use it for handoffs. So imagine we're in a regular staff meeting. We've invited a few additional stakeholders to sit in for the first 15 minutes. We'd start off with divergence. Given the problem that we've identified, given the vision that we have for the solution, we wanna give people a short brainstorm to get a list of as many possible solutions as possible. We've cheated a little bit because we've been working on S this with S2S states. So Nick, I'm wondering if you could share some of the solution ideas that have emerged from their brainstorming and from their divergence process. Sure, Clint. Um, yeah, lots of different ideas. Um, one that we've heard is to work with eligibility workers to cross train them so that they're better, better able to explain ENT options and kind of themselves begin that ENT navigation process. Um, the idea of putting together a handout, a brochure, some type of, of takeaway item for the, the SNAP participant themselves um, to use to you know, move on to their their next step you know whether it's you know meeting with an employment specialist or employment program whatever it might be uh, using you know technology text messaging things like that as reminders um, even considering um, adjusting office hours so um, lots of lots of lots of good possible ideas to, to to draw on that's great and so we'd start off by getting a list of ideas like that up in front of the group for consideration then 
we'd converge, identifying the strongest solutions, those that have the most impact, that are most feasible with given resources. We'd focus on a smaller set. For those, we'd identify the resources and dependencies among them. Sometimes in our innovation cycles, we find that things that sound like they're going to be easy are actually quite hard. They're deeply embedded in existing systems and processes that are much harder to change. And that makes them less palatable as solutions. Um, so we do that. We seek out feedback from people outside of the group. Um, we would make sure that we're not succumbing to groupthink, getting very invested in something that we come up with in one context and not getting feedback from outside, feedback from other stakeholders, feedback from staff, feedback if possible from participants. All of the first parts of this process could be done in one meeting. It could be done in part of a meeting. It could be done over email, and we've done it that way too. It can be done in any context in which you can make it work for your staff. It could be done asynchronously. It could be done synchronously. It can be done in person. It can be done over Zoom. Um, lots of different ways to do it. All of which brings us to this wireframe stage. Now, this is a bunch of technical jargon. I understand that. Um, but it's a really useful concept. So what a wireframe is, is a first version of representing our solution. To put it down on paper quickly and cheaply, flesh out how it would work in practice. It can be a drawing, it can be a storyboard of an interaction between two caseworkers handing off a client. And this is gonna sound a little bit goofy, but at the wireframe stage, we almost always encourage role play. Encourage someone to take the part of an intake worker, someone to take the part of an ENT specialist, someone to take the part of the client and try and use the wireframe to implement the new strategy for the new solution for making a handoff. And it really gets to the heart of the interaction. It makes it super clear what's missing that we would need to make it work. It also makes it clear what we've added to our solution that never seems to come up that maybe we don't need to spend resources to try and implement. Does it feel natural? Does it feel appropriate? Does it feel right? What revisions can we make? From the wireframe and with that feedback, we make the transition to prototypes. The prototype is the thing that you're going to test in your pilot. So it's all the materials, they're formatted, they're ready for presentation. It's the things that they're going to use. And speaking of testing, speaking of our pilot, we always wanted to be back in the back of our mind during the solution cycle, because the end of all this is trying out the solution to see if it works. So starting the solution, knowing that we're going to use it, starting to build the solution, knowing that we're going to try and assess it and remembering the MVP, the minimum viable product and that we're piloting to learn. So all this sounds super easy, I'm sure. Some of you have probably already started innovating and that's a joke, but honestly, it really is, it becomes clear and simple as you start using it. Um, I've seen it work in teams like yours, and I'm sure they don't have the talent that your team does. So I know that you can do this, and we're going to bring you through the rest of the process in just a minute. We're going to pause now, though, to take questions. I know that there are a handful in the chat. Um, we have time for one, I think, Donna, if you want to lift one up from the chat sure. for us to consider together. Sure. How about um, a question from Christine? Um, she's asking, how about strategies for involving the people who are receiving the services in this problem solving process, especially during COVID? Any thoughts about that? Uh, first, my first thought is I love it. You're speaking right to my heart, um, Christine. The, the sooner and the more we can bring participants in the services into this ideation, into thinking with us, the better we'll be able to understand and respond to barriers that they actually experience in solution design. So having standing panels that who we seek out feedback across our programmatic efforts, having regular outreach from our caseworkers that's focused on gathering feedback, making that habitual so that it's not a special occasion. It feels like we have to do extra work, but it's just something we're always doing to learn more about our project. We've seen examples of as teams launch an innovation cycle, identifying recent participants to incorporate on the team during the identification of problem cycle in the identification and development of solutions and actually incorporating them as team members up to and including um, compensation and honoraria around it. And that's been effective. It's the sort of thing that you'll want to start small and build comfort with 
um, and explore and see what works for you and your agency. Um, but something that we always encourage and try and achieve in our work. So you'll have another chance to ask questions at the end, um, but we're going to push ahead to the most important part, um, which is trying things. Ideation for its own sake is good, but we're only going to improve engagement and get more people to the next step if we get things into the world and see how they work with real participants. I'm sure your teams are going to have tons of great ideas, but we're committed to overcoming barriers and we'll overcome barriers by moving to pilots, taking our prototypes, taking our ideas as they've been realized in materials and getting them into the field. Innovation is about learning and adapting. Um, as we're implementing what we learn, we start with a set of basic questions to inform how we choose to implement it. We want to set learning goals and a timetable and performance targets and early warning signs and consider our approach to implementation. Um, Donna, thinking about the handoffs example that we've been taking, how would you approach a pilot um, for some of the solutions that Nick mentioned? Okay, um, so let's say that you've got um, five state offices in a region or county. You're just trying to think about how to set this pilot up. And each of those offices has eight to 10 eligibility workers. If you really stopped and thought about it, that would mean that across the region, there would be upwards of 50 people who could potentially participate. That's a lot of staff to train and get to implement the proposed solution. So rather than train everybody, it, it's, it's gonna be much better, more efficient to run a pilot. Um, and as you think about it, the pilot could be implemented in one office or it could be implemented in a few offices or across all office with offices with just a few staff. So in our example, um, we decide to implement uh, with five staff members in one office. And this decision was made because it, it would be easier to work with one office administrator, the staff supervisor, and the five people within one office. So. Yeah. And in that one office, we'll want to have a timetable, how long we're going to let the pilot run before we step back and try and assess its results. We'll set performance targets, how much change we'd expect to see from an intervention like innovation like the one we designed, and early warning signs that would tip us off right away if it's not working, things that staff might observe, things that we might see in our data system to know that our pilot is on the wrong track and needs um, to be discontinued even before the timetable, or that it's working smashingly and we should move up our assessment. Um, a couple of quick notes as we're making the transition. The first, it's totally insufficient to build something and assume that it's going to work. Um, writing down the perfect handoff procedure isn't worth that much if you don't get convince the staff to use it. So as we assess it, the first threshold question for all of our innovation efforts is, did it get tried? Did it get tried in the way that we designed it? As researchers, we obsess over that, over fidelity. Um, and it's really at the center of this. Did staff do the intervention? Did they do it in the way that they're going to? And to get them to do that, we have to remember that staff aren't robots. They're going to need support in the understanding the intervention and understanding their role in it so that the assessment, the learning that we generate is valid. So we get signal and not noise. And as you're finalizing your implementation plan, we strongly suggest that you plan for how you're going to support your staff during the pilot so that you can learn successfully. Um, Bob, what are some of the things you've seen that have really helped staff in implementing these interventions? Yeah, I think uh, where I've seen it work the best is when staff know uh, from the onset that they have the support and the, the buy-in of their leadership, that the leadership is behind them and what they're, you know, the, the changes they're implementing. Uh, and, and also to make sure they have the proper training. Uh, it's very important they, they have training and they, they know what's expected of them. You know, clear expectations are, are very important. Uh, but developing... Uh, We've seen states develop, uh, you know, handouts for for staff, so they have something that's really ready, ready and available to them to to show them what they need to do, and and uh, even some have uh, developed websites that uh, you know the staff can just you know click and you know get the information they, they need as they're implementing the change. So uh, again, that that support and training is is very important. Thanks so much. And one, just to tie back to one of the things we mentioned before, the more you can involve staff in development, the clearer the types of support that will be useful in implementation to them. 
So when you get to this stage in your innovation cycle, you have the problem, you have the solution, you have all the materials and the prototype ready to go. We have a great plan to implement the pilot. Life is good, we're living on easy street. And we come to the most important step. And because we're here to learn, how do we learn from this pilot? All through, we've been designed to learn. We wrote down our performance targets. We wrote down our timetable. We wrote down our early learning signs or early warning signs, excuse me. And in section four, the last section of your worksheet, the assessment, um, we're going to come to the big question that we always get asked. We have our bosses breathing down our necks asking us, did it work? Did the innovation increase engagement? Are the handoffs working better now than they did under the status quo? And this is everyone's top of mind question, but unfortunately it's rarely a clear yes or no. And it's especially rarely a clear yes or no when we're looking at the sorts of incremental change in innovation that we're talking about. We want you to push you to be specific and introspective and know that careful thinking around assessment leads to better decisions and better outcomes for your participants and for the program overall. So rather than asking, did it work? We tend to try and unpack the question a little bit. Um, and each of these three questions, work for whom, work for what, and work compared to what can have multiple answers. At this stage, it's helpful to revisit your vision statement. It can really help to guide your assessment here. Sometimes we find that different groups of stakeholders respond differently to an inter intervention. Uh, innovation that makes something easier for staff and that staff respond very positively to might not even be noticed by participants or by clients and may not have a big effect on their on client engagement and client outcomes. It's important at this stage to know that there are different ways for an intervention to work. There are different ways for an intervention to have room for improvement. But most important is to situate that assessment in the context of what was going on before, work compared to what. Um, to make sure that in addition to assessing your innovation, that you're measuring its outcomes, you're also measuring parallel outcomes for people who aren't seeing the innovation, who are seeing the old status quo. So you'll be able to observe the change um, that you're making. So learning is at the core of our innovation. And we wanna have our eye on that ball from the beginning, thinking through how we're going to measure and assess the change for whom and for what all the way through the process. So what other sources of information um, might be informative? There are lots of ways to get a signal. You can learn effectively from even very small pilot tests, even just one or two offices, one or two staff members. And so things that you might pay attention to, you might pay attention to quantitative data. How many clients before and after your innovation were making it through to the next step? How many were showing up at that next appointment? How many had to get reminder calls? You might consider qualitative data like the staff perception. You might consider data like participant perception. You may directly observe um, the interaction and the tone of the interaction in the innovation versus before. And you'll be looking for what happened. If you can, ask it compared to what. Um, and as you're assess assessing the outputs of your pilot, be sure to compare them back to the benchmarks that you wrote down. Um, during your implementation planning phase. And that's, again, why we suggest in the worksheet that you write down performance targets before you start implementing. We want to avoid motivated reasoning. We want to hit success targets that we pre-specified, that we had in mind before we started implementing. And though we've been inspired by behavioral science so far all day today, I wanna give you just one bit of behavioral science jargon um, that rears its ugly biasing head right at this phase of innovation. You've brought your solution all the way through this cycle of development. You believe in it, you're invested in it, you've committed to it, it's part of you. And you're starting to see the results and you have to decide what to do with it. Do you scale it? Do you persist it? Do you adapt it? Do you kill it? And there's an interesting tendency in learning cycles like these, in innovation cycles, to be really protective of the ideas that we've created and nurtured. Even if the data don't look so good, even if they're sometimes pretty, pretty darn bad um, on how something's working 
whether it's hitting performance targets. The behavioral science jargon for this is motivated reasoning, um, searching the data for the answer that we want to find in the data, that our innovation, that our idea that we created worked. And we know that people also suffer from a second bit of jargon, confirmation bias. We tend to believe the data that confirm our feelings, and we tend to reject or challenge data that refute our prior conception. In this innovation, we need to be brave and we need to be willing to admit that something's working differently or not as well as we want it to and be willing to adapt and change and even to abandon an idea and try something else instead. Think all the way back to our glacier. When it hits harder material, it doesn't keep stop moving forward. It still moves forward just in different directions and no glacier ever made its valley in the first day. We're almost there. I know that we're just at the end of our time together. And throughout, we've described this as a cycle. I wanna end on emphasizing that it is a cycle. We identify a problem, develop a solution, implement it, assess it, adapt it if necessary, based on the data and based on the courage to change and not be prisoners to our own preconceptions. But for it to be really a cycle, we eventually need to stop and move all the way back around to the start to the list of other problems that your team ably generated back at the beginning. So how do you know when you're done with an idea? Unfortunately, there's not a clear benchmark that I could give you right now for every ENT program or problem or solution. It's more of a feeling that you acquire and sharpen over time. You can look back to your implementation plan and your timetable. You can look back to the decisions that you pre-specified um, in terms of your timetable, in terms of your target outcomes. But what, ultimately what you want to avoid is the perpetual pilot, something that neither becomes standard practice nor gets discontinued, just sort of limps along and never really develops or goes away. One compromise is to link back to the idea of the minimum viable product, the MVP. If your first solution was imperfect, and it probably is, so many things, all things really leave room for improvement. You can start your next cycle in the solution development phase. You can work with your team to identify and develop the next level of maturity in the space that you're already working. What's the next feature that you can build to improve your outcomes based on what you learned in the first try? The most important thing is forward momentum. Keep pushing forward, keeping focused on the places where you can improve engagement and returning to the needs and to the clients. Not everything you're going to try is going to work, but very little will be improved by not trying anything. And that's not just in Snap ENT. The world is always in motion as we've all experienced in the past year. And whether you experiment intentionally or not, staff, participants, partners are going to be innovating and adapting. But when you follow this framework, again, adapting it to your own needs and context, you're taking control and allocating your efforts systematically and purposefully directed to the places where you perceive the greatest need. We're just at the end of our time now, and we appreciate those of you who have persisted. You're already like glaciers, just always moving forward. You probably noticed there were a bunch of places where we referenced back to the worksheet that was put in the chat at the beginning, and Annie, I'll ask you to put it in the chat again now at the end. Um, but you may have noticed in it that some of the format was a little bit weird for today, and some of the fields were never mentioned. If you open up a blank copy of the worksheet, or if you open it up for the first time, it's also designed to be a tool that you can use to enact these steps for real. You can use it to record your intentions for your own innovation process and to track your progress through the stages as you try this out, as you adapt it to your own context to strengthen your ENT program and improve the experience for your staff, for your partners, and ultimately and importantly for your participants who at the end of the day, we want to engage with the valuable and important services that ENT can offer to them. Thank you all so much. Um, we're at the end of our time now and I've enjoyed so much um, getting a chance to share some of our approaches that we use here at MDRC and SJI and in the Snap to Skills project um, with you today. Up on the screen, there's some contact information for the Snap to Skills program for our group at MDRC, the Center for Applied Behavioral Science. Um, I put my email up and we'll stay on the line for a little bit longer if you want to put questions into chat. Before you go, we're going to give you one final poll 
um, one final chance to pre-commit to some ideas. I thank you for your time and for your attention today, and I look forward to engaging with you all in innovation around SNAP ENT in the future. Thanks so much. I'm loving these responses in the polls. It's very exciting for me personally. Um, for those of you who still have questions and you're indicating that in the poll, we are going to be here for a little while. Um, and I've put my email address on there. We're happy to think with you about how these ideas might work for your agency, for your context, for your setting. Yeah, I saw a question in the chat about um, when to start thinking about the assessment questions, um, which is a fantastic question. I would recommend as early as possible. I think as we, one of the things we often do is we're developing problems and problem statements and coming to a consensus around what to work on is looking at how the problems present in the data that we already have. So looking at handoffs, for instance, what are the, what proportion of people are making the transition from an intake worker to an ENT navigator under the status quo? And using that to set targets very early on for what we think concrete improvement might look like. What, cha what sort of metrics we would apply for staff, what sort of metrics we'd apply for participants and what sort of level of change we want to target our solution to. Are we looking at five percentage points improvement? Do we want to stretch and try and reach 10 or 15 percentage points of improvement with a bigger idea? Um, a question in the chat for people who are working alone. Um, I use this exact framework all the time in my daily life. Um, it is a question of thinking systematically. And one of the ways to do it is to really lean on the worksheet and lean on the habit of writing things down for ourselves um, and thinking through how innovation might work. And this could be applied to things that we're doing in our work in our working lives. One of the things that we're going to do as a group later is to do an assessment of this presentation and see what worked well for us from our development cycle and what we might do differently next time. Um, I don't wanna to sound too much like a trust the process person, but it really is a process um, that can be ap applied and adapted to just about every different context, including working independently. Um, there's a question about whether you can have a copy of the slides. Absolutely. Um, we'll need to do some thinking on our end as to the best way to share them. Um, but we will we'll think together about that um, and identify and test a solution. And the same I, and the same for the recording. I know this is being recorded. Um, I got the pop-up at the beginning, like everyone. Um, so I think we can figure out, I think there's a place where the recordings go. Um, but I don't know it. So we'll have to assemble a team to figure it out. Oh, sorry about that.
So thank you all so much for your time and attention today. Um, hopefully you have our contact information and from the invite know how to get in touch with all of us. We'll look forward to connecting with you next time. Um, wishing you all a great afternoon. Thank you so much.